It's 302 and this is a recipe that I'm very excited to get started on. So if you hear a little ping in the background, that might be someone joining us a little bit later. But for now, I would love to get started and introduce myself. My name is Erin Wygant. I work for the San Juan Islands Visitors Bureau. And this is our 13th Savor the San Juans, which is our fall celebration of food, farms, and films. We so wish that we could be doing these tours and classes with you in person, but we're so grateful for those of you that have joined us here on Zoom. So without further ado, I would like to introduce and thank our chef for the day, Chef Tim Payne of Coho Restaurant, who's here to share with us a delicious fall recipe. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, this is my first Zoom event, I think, so uh, it's gonna be interesting uh, looking at yourself. <laughs> is always uh, fun. Uh, but we're gonna talk about a dish that's currently on our menu right now. Um, and we, uh, at Coho, we are very much in tune with seasonality. We change our menu around five or six times a year. And a lot of that is driven by produce and what is, what's available. So with recently, we've kind of moved to more of a fall menu format, uh, featuring what is coming available now uh, fall and we generally do one of our two handmade pasta entrees to feature what is most seasonally like beautiful tastes great and represent representative of the time of year that we're in so we're going to make a pasta called garganelli um and we'll talk a little bit about the pasta itself in just a moment but a few of the ingredients that uh, those of you who saw the ingredient list have seen uh, which is a slight refresher um Number one are, is winter squash. Uh, we're just now starting to see our winter squash from our local farms. Uh, today we're using a lot of produce from Sweet Earth Farm here on the island. We've been working with Amanda and the Tea family for a long time. I've been with Coho three years and we've worked with them all three years. They supply a good amount of our produce. Uh, and Amanda does an amazing job growing things that are flavorful uh, and bountiful at the moment and also good to the earth relations farms. Uh, so well, winter squash. So we have, I have a few different varieties. Uh, choose the ones that are your favorite. Uh, we use for this dish primarily butternut squash, uh, but you could, this is a carnival pumpkin um, or any kind of high pumpkin would work. Acorn squash would work as well. And of course, uh, we have delicata. Uh, the benefit of delicata is the flesh is the most edible, so you don't have to worry about cleaning it. Um, but in the recipe, we talk about uh, kind of prep already squash. And in this instance, this dish comes together very quickly. Most of the work is done ahead of time. So when you actually get to the finishing process, your squash is already cooked. So how to cook that squash? Um, we generally boil ours in salted water. And you want to cook it until it's all the way through. Because in the finished cooking process, uh, you certainly don't want it al dente because you're not going to cook it long enough to continue the cooking process. So don't be afraid, even if it's slightly overcooked, uh, that will add a little bit to the body of the dish. And it's also nice to do a couple of different squash. Winter squash are extremely, extremely healthy for you and are good storage. They're going to be around now through spring. Um, and you know, they're pretty price, uh, they're pretty. The price-wise, they're not very expensive as well. We're also going to feature kale. Uh, again, this kale comes from Sweet Earth, and we're going to use the kale in two different places. So we're going to use it a little bit in the pesto, and I'll explain the pesto here in a second. And then we're going to use it with the winter squash as well. Now, some people take that vein out that you see in, in kale. In this case, we're taking the leaves out and chopping them, but also cut up the stem itself. Because the stem, if it's sliced thin, adds a lot a really good texture. And then you're using the entire uh, plant as well, which we try to do here, so there's no waste. So let's talk about the pasta. Any dry pasta will work. Choose your favorite one. I think this links itself a little bit better to the pasta that would fall in the realm of uh, ziti, penne, rigatoni, uh, those that are like shorter, sturdy. Uh, and um, not your noodle-based pastas, but you're certainly, if that's what you want to use, then go for it. Um, and then the pesto itself, it's going to be a little bit non-traditional um, compared to other pestos you may have done in the past. So in traditional 
basil pesto. It is pine nuts, garlic, and parmesan. In this case, we're using feta instead of the parmesan. We're using walnuts instead of the pine nuts. And then we're going to use a combination of parsley, sage, and kale. Um, and we'll talk about the pesto, and we're going to do that real quickly here. The pesto comes together in a matter of a couple of minutes. The pasta itself, um, I'm going to speak very briefly about handmade pasta. In the 30 minute time limit we have, we certainly can't do that completely from start to finish. But at the bottom of the ingredient list, for those of you making your own pasta, I have our kind of standard pasta we use. We use an egg based pasta. Um, and it's a simple ratio of two cups of flour to eight eggs, which is one whole egg and seven egg yolks. Like this, a, a little bit of oil, the oil of your choosing. Uh, we typically use extra virgin olive oil, a pinch of salt, and then we actually use a food processor to help get that to come together. It's something, and when I do pasta cooking classes here at the restaurant, which we do every year, people are a little bit uh, skeptical. But what is real important when you're making handmade pasta is that you are able to get, number one, hydrate it properly, which means you have enough liquid that everything is dissolved and incorporated into the dough. So when people try to do that by hand many times, what they end up with is little clumps of dry flour in their dough. Uh, the good thing about a food processor is with the blade, it actually cuts that flour, the egg into the flour, and makes it a uniform mixture. Um, depending on the size of your eggs, in that recipe, I don't put anything about water. Um, depends, because that does depend on how big your eggs are. So if you're using a smaller egg, if you're using farm eggs, uh, they're usually not uniformly sized. So some may be small, some may be extra large, etc. So you may have to add a splash of water to get it to come together. And essentially you want it soft enough where if you picked it up and you squeezed it, it would squeeze together. For those of you old enough, think of uh, Play-Doh. That's kind of the texture you want. Um, one of the other reasons we're not doing that today is because generally when you make the pasta, so when you combine it in the food processor, you're gonna need it for about five minutes. You're gonna wrap it up and it needs to rest at least 30 minutes, but no more than an hour. If you're gonna let it rest more than an hour, you wanna put it in the fridge. And, you're ready to use it. and when it's done, it's gonna have uh, consistency. You see how I cut it. Here, and you can see it's uniformly mixed. You don't see any uh, random dry pieces of flour, etc. And if you can look, it squeezes pretty easy, but it's not sticking to my hands as well. The garganelli shape is a fun shape. Um, a lot of people don't really aren't that familiar with it, but it uses. If you're going to roll this at home, um, it's going to use a gnocchi board, uh, which you can buy on Amazon for about five to six bucks. Um, some of them are sold with a dowel, but in lieu of this, a clean, I should say a COVID clean number two lead pencil would work. And uh, I'm gonna pull out a sheet to show you, for those of you who are making your own pasta, you wanna roll it relatively thin. So I'm gonna pull a sheet out and show you kind of how thin it would be. You can see that you can, uh, the light through it, you can see through it, so you want it pretty thin. And what you're doing is you're cutting this dough into roughly two by two inch squares. And I'll just demonstrate how to roll one or two of these so you can see it. So if you're going to do this, you're placing it triangle down. And you want to dust your dowel because it might stick. And you're wrapping it around the little dowel and you're just rolling it. And then it slides off. So what you end up with is a pasta that's about two to three inches long um, and it's tubular shaped. So now you can see where the pen A or T and so forth are going to stand into this. Let's talk about the pesto. And that's kind of what brings us all together. Pestos are really great um, because they're really quick pasta sauces. It's important when you make your pesto that the pesto is somewhat pungent. So it should be almost, uh, it should taste almost garlicky when you eat it raw, because you have to remember that 
all the flavor that's in the pesto is going to get muted whenever you add the squash, the pasta, and the kale. So it's it's if you don't add enough flavor in the pesto itself, you're going to end up with a really bland finished pasta dish. So for those of you who are making this uh, with the ingredient list we have, I'm going to pull some of these out. So we have two two sets of ingredients here. One is the kind of green component of this, and I have uh, parsley. I have a little bit of kale and uh, sage. So you notice the sage is the smallest, as far as the ratio of greens here, it's the smallest amount. Sage is very pungent. Um, sage also oxidizes really bad. That may or may not be important to you. Usually, most people aesthetically like that bright green pesto. Um, if that's not important to you, it's a this is probably a non-issue. But we're getting at the body of the, of the pesto from the parsley. Um, and then we're going to use some kale. Kale gives it, uh, has a very, very subtle bitter quality, but also has a ton of chlorophyll in it. So that when you puree this, it helps the pesto stay greener longer. We add a little bit of kale to a lot of our pestos here. And then sage, of course, is where the main flavors come. Um, we use, with the parsley, we use the stem as well as the leaves. So use the whole thing. The stems have great flavor. The other component of this is um, our walnuts. If you are allergic to walnuts or allergic to nuts in general, many, most people who are allergic to nuts can eat seeds. So sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds would work equally as well. If you have the time, I would toast the nuts. It helps bring the oils to the surface and the oils, as you know, that's where a lot of the flavor is for many things, including nuts, so toasting them and then let them cool because you don't want to put hot nuts in here and then delicate greens because that's going to almost cook the greens whenever you puree the pesto. And then we have feta. You can use, fill in, you know, this is kind of a guideline and you can tailor it to how you, to your own personal preferences. So if you don't like feta, uh, you can certainly use Parmesan or goat cheese, etc. One thing I would recommend if you are using feta or you're using goat cheese, is that you crumble it. Don't put a solid block of it in here because you're going to have to stop and break it with your hands. Even the best food processors can't take the solid block and break it into small pieces very easily. Um, I have garlic. Now I have two cloves, uh, I believe, in the ingredient list. So when you, and a head of garlic, the cloves are a lot of times different sizes. So what you want, I would suggest medium sized cloves. So I, you know, as an example, I cut the pasta when I was doing this and I was breaking the cloves up. You can see that they're of different shapes. So you have small, you have medium, you have large. Um, I think this needs a lot of garlic. So I would suggest two medium or larger sized cloves. And you, again, you want to chop it before you put it in the food processor because dropping a solid clove of garlic in the processor and then thinking that you're going to be able to chop that up with everything else, it just doesn't work. And you end up over processing the uh, pesto, instead of it becoming a pesto, it turns into a paste, which is not exactly what you want here. I have lemon. We're going to use the lemon twice. We're going to squeeze half of the lemon juice in the pesto, and then we're going to add a little lemon at the end to the finished pasta. And then a restaurant, I didn't put this in there, um, but something most, I would call it a restaurant trick, but whenever we do lemon in any recipe, we also include the zest. So the zest are where all the oils are in the lemon, where a lot of aroma and flavor is. So in this, I zested the lemon. Um, if you have a microplane or a box grater, if you're using a box grater, use the finest uh, grade you can, uh, or buy one of these for less than $10 on Amazon or any website based thing. They're, they're great, they're useful. Uh, you can do a lot of different things with it. But we've graded the zest for the lemon. So what we're going to do is we're going to start putting this in the food processor. So I like to put the greens in, on, in two levels. So we're going to put half the greens in the bottom here. And then we're going to add our solid ingredients. And then we're going to add more greens on top. And it seems like a lot, but whenever you puree this down, it, it's, it shrinks quite a bit. 
So I'm going to put the solid things in here. So we have the zest, the garlic, the walnuts, and the feta, being careful that the feta is broken up appropriately. We're going to add the lemon at the end. And you see here, the feta, it's broken up relatively small, which means it's going to be incorporated. The idea is to incorporate things and have almost uh, a pebbly type quality, somewhere between a sand texture and a pebble texture, small pebble texture, and not necessarily a paste. So we're going to put this in. And we're going to top it with the rest of our greens here. Salt, salt, you know, the feta or cheese is going to have salt, so go white and you can taste it later. I, anyone who does what I do, we like a lot of salt. So um, I would say add a lot of salt, but some people don't. I'm going to add just a little bit of lemon now, and I'm going to not squeeze all of it. And then uh, I'm going to put the lid on. If you have a pleasing art, one of the little hidden gems of a pleasing art is this too which has a little drain hole. And most people don't even realize what it's for. What it's for is making things like vinaigrettes or mayonnaise or aioli because it's a really small, steady stream of oil. You don't have that, just you're gonna wanna, you wanna add the oil slowly. You don't wanna dump all of it in there. So the first thing I'm gonna do though is I'm gonna pulse this to kind of get the process started. So what makes Greens turn from bright green to army green is the the heat that's applied when you're spinning a blade that is generating heat. So you notice I'm not turning it on and just leaving it on, but I'm just kind of pulsing it. And I haven't added a thing yet. And if I were to stop here and show you, it's kind of slowly getting incorporated here. It's going to have some chunks, which is fine. Now we're gonna add oil. Now, I would suggest for this dish, you're gonna probably need about um, six to eight ounces of oil. I say that because we're not doing any of the measurement by weight, we're doing it by volume, and some people are really type A about measuring things, and some people aren't. Uh, I tend to be a little heavy, I just like jam stuff in, so sometimes I need a little bit more. So start with six. And I'm going to show you the texture. And if it's not that texture, just add a little bit. So I'm going to pour it in, fill up our little tube. And we're just going to, again, I'm not letting the motor like, run consistently. I'm just doing a little short burst here. And it's not supposed to be emulsified, which is the uniform mixture of two different ingredients. So it's, if it's, there's oil sitting on top, that's completely fine. So don't worry about it being like a uniform paste. The paste isn't necessarily your friend with this. And it's hard to tell, but you can tell it that the, the uh, it's becoming a more gra a sand gravelly and a little bit more pasty. Also, don't be afraid if it's a little thick because when you add it to your pasta, you're gonna get residual water and juices and that's gonna thin it out as well. And I'm gonna stop right here. As soon as I know the oil's in. And I'm gonna pull some out and show you guys what I have so far. And uh, traditionally pesto in Italy was never made with a food processor. It was made with a mortar and pesto. Um, or one of those round rocking knives where they essentially put everything in a mortar pestle and they pounded it to kind of mash it together, or they used a cutting device to cut everything together. So they never were intending for it to become like this peanut butter type case. It's always going to have a little bit of texture. So let's get a spoon here. And you can see here, as well as you can, that there's uh, some, some chunks. The greens are a little more pureed but because the feta and the walnuts shouldn't be browned to a paste. And the last thing we want to do here is we're going to taste it. And this is where you have to use your own palate to make a decision. Is it, if you like salt, then you may want to add salt. If you like 
you know, a little more of the spice maybe from some uh, black pepper or red chili flake. You certainly can add it at this point too. But essentially, this is your little flavor bomb that we're going to utilize in making the pasta. Um, I tend to like a lot of acid. Um, so that's why I'm suggesting lemon juice here and then lemon juice at the end. Um, because if you think of it like uh, fatty things like butter and cheese kind of poke the both the palate, whereas acid will help wipe that clean and add another flavor to it. That's about where I, I like it. And so there, you have this. This is way more than you're going to need for unless you're cooking for about 30 people. Uh, it's way more than you're going to need. So what you can do when you store this is I suggest getting if you can find these little deli cups, these are great, or a little Tupperware. But when you store it, what you want to do is when you put it on here, put it in a little cup, uh, pour a thin layer on top of oil. And what that does is that helps the air. So what will happen over time if it's exposed to air is that it will start turning different shades of green and eventually it will turn kind of a blackish color, which isn't the most appetizing color in the world. A thin layer of uh, oil on top and then a lid or a little piece of wax paper uh, where you press it to the top surface of the pesto would be a good trick. It can be frozen at this point. It'll stay in your refrigerator for a good seven to two weeks depending on how cold your refrigerator is and how safe you are in terms of uh, you know not using a spoon that's dirty where you're introducing bacteria and so forth. But it'll last a while, so making a big batch is great. Um, in the summer or in the fall when you have things that you want to use in the pesto, um, they may only be around for a while, um, and then they're gone. So maybe some, some people like to make big batches of pesto, have it in the freezer, and it's perfect, pull it out, thaw it out, and then if you want to have a quick meal with pasta, it's also a really helpful topping to meats, fish, ch uh, poultry, Vegetables, it's great on a baked potato. Um, and so it's, it's got a lot of uses to it. So let's talk about the, executing the pasta dish itself. Let me just move this out of the way. And uh, we have our camp stove. Um, we're camping indoors today. So what I have here is uh, water that is uh, boiling. When you cook, if you're cooking a packaged dried pasta, you're going to want to follow the box directions. Um, it's amazing to me how many people don't know. And those box, direct, box directions work. We're at sea level, so we don't have to accommodate for anything. But if this says six to eight minutes, it's six to eight minutes. Set a timer. Uh, this is not a pasta where you're adding a very uh, liquidy kind of sauce to it, like a bolognese or a marinara. Uh, or a pomodoro or something where the pasta is going to, the rule of thumb generally is, and you know, in the restaurant rule would be put 70, 70 to 80 percent in the water and then the last 20 to 30 percent uh, with the liquid based sauce. This, as you can tell, is not a liquid based sauce. So you're going to want to have it fairly fully cooked. The actual saute part of this goes relatively quickly. So by the time that you start boiling your pasta and it boils and ready to come off, what you're going to add it to should already pretty much be done cooking. So I have, we set our raw squat aside. I'm not doing, um, this is, would be a maybe a one or two person size dish just for, to show you guys. But I have a, a medium sized saute pan. Um, I have diced butternut squash here, and I have the stems from the kale, and I have some chopped up kale leaves. What type of kale? Uh, any kale would work. This happens to be, I believe, it's lacinato kale, which is my favorite, um, but use whatever one. You can also substitute spinach, Swiss chard. You want to do uh, not a leafy green, uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, any of those things will work as well. Just keep in mind that whatever it is, that it's fairly quick cooking. And because again, you're not gonna be cooking this a long time. So I have, if you're using fresh pasta, it's gonna cook pretty quick. 
So if you rolled out your own pasta, whereas being eight to 10 or 10 to 12 minutes, it's probably going to be more like fresh pasta, like three or four. So we're going to throw that in here. I have my pan preheated. In our saute pan, we're going to add a little bit of oil, a neutral oil. We use non-GMO rice bran oil here at the restaurant. Um, something that has a smoke, a high smoke point generally. So whether that's grapeseed oil, uh, safflower, sunflower, regular olive oil would work as well. And again, this is already cooked, so I'm essentially just getting in a little bit of color and uh, going to heat it through. I'm also going to add my stems. I got my nice sizzle. I was worried you wouldn't get the uh, sound part of cooking. But yeah, you can hear it sizzling. Again, uh, it's already cooked, so it's not going to take long. I have uh, my kale I've added, the leaf part of it. Now I cook my squash in salted water. So I've already tasted the squash, which I would encourage you to do. If the squash tastes seasoned from cooking it in salted water, there's no need to add other salt because you're going to get salt from the uh, pesto. But if it does, you know, if it did get salted, you're going to want to add that. So once I see that the kale is wilted down, I'm actually going to turn it off. With pesto, you're not cooking the pesto. It's there. It's going to coat the pasta. I'm putting in for what I just did. I would say per portion, you want a, a, a couple of tablespoons of pesto. So think of that whenever you're doing it. Um, here I put two tablespoons. I'm going to add just a little bit more. And then I am going to add a little bit of lemon juice. Watch for see. And see, this is warm enough that whenever the pesto heats all the warm, hits all the warm ingredients, it's going to uh, add a little bit of liquid to it. And you can see how the pesto has already started kind of spreading out here. I'm going to take a look at my pasta here. Uh, you just want to feel it. It looks great. So we're going to add our pasta. Um, a little restaurant trick, uh, too, is when you're dragging the pasta, the, what you're putting into looks a little dry. You don't want to lot, but drag just a little bit of water in like that, and that helps rehydrate things. You could do this as well where you uh, cook the squash and you put it in a bowl and then add the pesto and kind of gently stir it around and then add the hot pasta on top of that and it, that works great and then you can put it right into a serving bowl so now we're going to take this and i'm just using a spoon to toss everything together and this type of uh particularly if you're using Pasta is a starch that once it's cooked is a sponge for whatever flavor you're going to have. So it's going to absorb everything. The pasta in and of itself is fairly neutral. But when it's cooked, that starch is like a sponge for whatever flavor. So right now it's picking up the garlic, it's picking up the cheese, and the lemon juice. And I'm just going to hold this where you can see it. And you can see where it's, it's also when it cooks, it gets real sticky. So you can see where the pesto is sticking to the pasta, which is exactly what you want. And with pesto-based pasta dishes, it's uh, it's not a real liquidy sauce. And so there we have it. We're going to plate this. I guess this would be one person if you're hungry. This is like tin size. I love pasta, so I eat a lot. And you'll notice that the noodles uh, here 
they've held their shape. So if you see, it still looks like a tube. So the pasta is not overcooked, but it's cooked through. And real quickly, we'll talk about a couple of garnishes for this. Since there's walnut in the dish, walnut on top would be great. So what this is, is what we do at the restaurant. So we toast walnuts and we just chop walnuts together with parsley and sage. And that gives it a little extra texture on top. That's one good option. Another option is just more toasted walnuts. It's nice because it's a soft, supple dish to have a crunchy texture as a counterpoint. So having whatever nut you use in the pesto a little bit extra toasted to go on top is really good. And since we use feta in the pesto, we're going to use feta to garnish. So I'm just going to crumble some feta. Some people like a lot of cheese, some people don't. But then we have the finished dish. So as you can see, it's pretty quick. There's just a little bit of, of, of prep work ahead of time. The actual pesto uh, with food processor or blender is really, really, you know, it's, it's an efficient thing. And again, that recipe will make a lot. So it's enough for several uh, pasta dinners you might have. And then um, if you do make your own pasta, uh, one little thing is that batch I put on is a lot of pasta. So you can put it on cookie sheets and freeze it which is what we do here at the restaurant. And then we just buy sand we just use sandwich bags and um, put individual portions in sandwich bags. So we go in the freezer and pull it out, put it in the water from frozen. It's still only about three minutes to cook. So do it in the process. And that's what we have. This is our fall garganelli pasta dish with winter squash, kale, and sage, walnut, parsley, and feta pesto. Tim, you have a couple questions from the crowd. Uh -huh. You say with seven egg yolks and one full egg. That's correct, yep, yep, seven egg yolks. So um, our ratio is two cups of flour. We use all-purpose flour, which is what I would recommend you using because semolina is pretty difficult for people to work with. Um, and so it's one whole egg and seven egg yolks to equal eight eggs total and then make some egg white, egg white omelets with the uh, leftover whites. How thick was the original sheet of pasta? Um, the original sheet, when I started rolling, so we have a mechanical roller, uh, but if you have a hand roller, most of them are on numbers 1 to 10 or 1 to 8. So I roll it to the second thinnest setting for gardening. So when we do cut pastas like fettuccine, linguine, palatelli, we would go to the third thickest, and then or to the third thinnest. And for garganelli, we do the second fence. And then if we're doing a filled pasta, because you're doubling the size of the dough by folding it over, we go to the thinnest setting. So the second thinnest setting on your roller is what we use. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. This has been so fun to watch you create such a beautiful, beautiful dish. Um, we still have some more questions rolling in from the chat. Um, the next one is, how long can you keep the pesto? Uh, the pesto in your refrigerator, if you were seven to 10 days, Definitely. Uh, if you do add a little bit, that little film of oil on top, or have plastic wrap or wax paper on the uh, on the press to the top, you could probably get two weeks out of it. Um, just be careful if you're sticking like anything that might carry bacteria, like a spoon. Hey, I want to taste it, and you taste it, and just don't put the spoon back in there. If you're not introducing bacteria. That oil is almost like an airtight uh, layer on top. So easily seven to 10 days in the fridge, in the freezer for a few months for sure. Right, it looks like Stephanie is raising her hand with a question maybe. Stephanie, if you wanna unmute yourself or ask a question. Thanks. Um, yeah, I did the pesto along with you and it looks beautiful. I wanna do the noodles or the pasta now, but when you mix it all together, did you say Refrigerate it, or did I? I wasn't. I didn't hear that part before you roll it out. Um, the the pasta dough. Yes. Yeah. So if you're making the pasta dough, you want to. It once you knead it, it needs to rest. And what happens is the dough relaxes, which makes it uh, easier to manipulate. So once you make the pasta dough, the fresh pasta dough, you want it to sit out at room temperature thirty minutes to an hour. 
if it's going to, if you're not going to roll it out for more than an hour, I would suggest refrigerating. Okay. So the only thing that may come into play when you're first making your own pasta dough is getting the texture right. And so okay. if it's extremely wet, refrigerating it before you roll it out will help, will make it a lot easier. Because working with super wet pasta dough could be a challenge. <laughs> Um, right. Here's yeah. here's my pesto. That looks, oh, looks great. great. Looks perfect. Good job. Thank you. Now, when when you cook, I thought we'd have to cook the um, the squash ahead of time, so I steam mine and then cut it up. But I can still cook it, and then you add more of the greens with that. Is that what you were doing? Yeah, we added a little bit of kale to the pasta itself too. Kale. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's super. Yeah, and, uh, you, can yeah. That, you can bake it, um, you can boil it, whatever you decide to, to do. This is okay. that's the important. Okay, great. I have, um, we've, we've got a question that's similar to that, asking how do you prepare the squash in advance? So we start, um, we start our squash, anytime we're doing uh, really dense vegetables, whether it's root vegetables like carrots, turnips, beets, potatoes, or whether it's dense vegetables like winter squash, is we start in cold, salted water, bring it to a simmer, and then um, once it comes to a simmer, I let it simmer for about, and this is depending upon how big you dice the vegetable. So uh, the squash we used was about the size of a nickel. That's about how big I cut mine. And with that, once it came to a simmer, it only needed to cook about another three or four minutes. But the important thing is taste it. So once it comes to a simmer, I'll take a bite, see how uh, done it is, and then set a timer. Like we, I use tons of timers because I am not good enough about remembering things. Um, so, so those two didn't help your head at all, huh? <laughs> apparently not. But yeah, um, just taste. And when it tastes like it's cooked through, remove it. It will continue to cook, what's called carryover cooking, which anything you remove from heat cooking when it sets, it still has, it's still hot, so it's gonna cook a little bit longer. But again, this is a dish where if the pasta is, if the squash is a little more cooked, and maybe you'd like it, it's not the end of the world. Great, we, we've got a, another question asking, uh, do you put some olive oil in the recipe when making your own pasta? Is there olive oil in the pasta recipe? Um, in this dish, I didn't use olive oil at all. I used all uh, rice bran oil. I even use rice bran oil in the pasta dough itself. It's what our all-purpose oil. It's a not. It's a regional non-GMO product. If you like, you can use olive oil. Absolutely, there's a ton of health benefits to olive oil. Um, it's great. Regular olive oil has a, a higher, has a decent, decently high smoke point, which means you can cook it at a high temperature without it turning brown and uh, it changing the flavor of the oil. That's what that means. So olive oil would work just as well as what I use. We freeze it raw. Yeah, you don't want to freeze it uh, cooked. It does weird things to it. Um, so we freeze it. We put it in a single layer on a sheet here. It looks like this. So we use wax paper or parchment paper. We dust it with flour. And then we just lay the pasta in layers. And then in the freezer. And once it feels firm to the touch, then we bag it. You want, to wait, you want to make sure it's frozen all the way through before you bag it, or it'll freeze at the big clump of pasta. So essentially, you're doing individually quick frozen pasta here to steam it yourself. And then once you bag it, that seals the air out, which will help keep the pasta longer. And it also means you won't pick up any random uh, aromas from what you have in your freezer. Everyone has something they forgot in the back of their freezer, which sometimes when you open it, you're like, oh, what's that smell type of thing? It won't pick up any of that, which can be a little bit off-putting if you're not here. We, we also have a question asking if you have a preferred brand or type of feta cheese. Whatever is local. I mean, if you go to the farmer's market, um, I would get Sunnyfield Farms. It's expensive, but it's a super high quality and super local. Um, as far as mass-produced feta, I don't necessarily have of a, a preferred brand. We tend to try to source our dairy as regionally as possible. So we try to find something that's Washington State, Oregon, and if not that, we try to go to California. That's usually the next closest. That's how we source things. Uh, 
Andre at Sunnyfield is an amazing cheese maker. Um, and you don't really need a lot of feta because it's super, maybe expensive per pound, but you a little bit goes a long way. So you may be only using, I mean, here I think the recipe is four ounces for a lot of pesto. So you can buy us, it may be like, I don't know off the top of my head, but let's say it's like twelve dollars a pound. Well, if you're only using four ounces, you're only spending you know like three or four bucks for the the cheese that goes into a massive batch of pesto. So that's who I would recommend. Great. Uh, another question asking if you ever freeze lasagna pasta dough, and if so, how thick is the lasagna pasta? The lasagna pasta, we roll out to the same thickness as our palatelli, fettuccine, et cetera. So it's the, the third thinnest layer. So it's thicker than what you'd roll for the garganelli. So if you have a machine that has number one being the widest to 10 being the thinnest, then you would roll that out to number seven, seven or eight. Okay. Uh, another pasta question, if you have experience with gluten-free pasta, and if you have any tips. Um, I, do, I, I do not have much experience with making gluten-free pasta, but there are several really good brands of dry gluten-free pasta. And the biggest thing with gluten-free pasta that I found is that when it overcooks, it really kind of can disintegrate. So just be really careful about watching that uh, when you're cooking it. Definitely set a timer. Uh, when you're cooking gluten-free pasta, I'd recommend setting a timer for at least a minute before the package says. Uh, that it should be ready and tasting it. And as soon as it's close to being ready, get it out of the water. Because uh, for whatever, I, I don't know the science, but it tends when you overcook it, it really falls apart quicker than uh, regular gluten-filled pasta. Does. Great. And this final question is, I think, a really great way to wrap up. It's asking if the recipe is going to be emailed. And yes, we will be able to share this recipe with you. The ingredients list is already posted on the event page uh, and in the email that you received, but we will be sending out a follow-up email that includes the, the recipe, the ingredients, as well as this whole Zoom recording. So you can go back in time and follow along with, with Chef Tim here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, right. Chef Tim. That's right. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.